helping you start while I'm concentrating on getting this done. So I'm Laura Kammermeyer and I I'm, I'm work for the Cornell Lab of Ornithology in Ithaca, New York. And my role there is to be the communications and marketing manager for Birds of the World. I've been with the lab, well, six years or so. Um, I did work for them a long time ago and they took me back because birds are everything and I really love the work that we're doing here. So my job is to basically help people access it all over the world and, and various means and help support partners like, like uh, Derek and the uh, JBVVF as we'll, we'll uh, get into a bit more as we go along, um, just to kind of support partners and, and make sure that the resources and um, as widely accessible as possible. So um, that's what I'm doing here. And I'm really happy to be sitting with uh, Derek on Derek's show. So thank you. Thanks, Laura. Hi, um, I'm Derek Engelbrecht. Uh, some of you will know me, some not. Um, I'm a lecturer at the University of Limpopo in the Department of Zoology. Uh, my passion is birds, uh, birding, um, the biology of birds and so on. And um, I am the, the editor-in-chief of uh, the Robert's Aid Project, uh, together with a team, which I'll introduce just now. Um, and purpose of tonight's talk is to tell those who are not familiar with the pro project or would like to know more about it, what the project is about, wh how we got here. So I'll tell you a bit about the history of Roberts, how we got to, to where we are now with the Roberts Aid Project, and then our uh, collaboration with um, uh, Cornell and the Birds of the World team. Um, I also just want to thank Derek and Learn the Birds. Um, for providing us with this platform um, to share our um, vision and, and I'll uh, tell you a bit more about this project. So I'm going to give you, a, it's not a long slideshow, I mean, I'm going to hand over to Laura and then we'll have a, you know, a, just a question and answer session where we'll field your questions. Right, so I hope everyone can see the screen all right. I think it looks okay. For those of you, I see, you know, we've got people from all over the world, but in Southern Africa, we have a very proud history, um, the Roberts brand. Uh, it started in 1940 with Austin Roberts producing the first issue. In essence, summarizing what was known at the time about birds uh, of um, Southern Africa. But interestingly enough, the first few issues were called the birds of South Africa, even though it included um, you know, Southern Africa, Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, and Mozambique. Um, the later issues, you know, got it correct as birds of Southern Africa. So these are all the, the previous issues, and it's grown in, in stature until the monumental publication in 2005 of the, we just call it the Big Roberts, affectionately, which was a mammoth book. I can't remember what it weighs, something like four and a half kilos or something. Uh, really set the tone for you know any future um, birding work in Southern Africa. So these are the issues. And so just to go back a little bit in history, the, the Roberts brand of books has now been going for 83 years. So it's a, it's a long time. Uh, sold about 340,000 copies, which I believe after the Bible, it is the most... <laughs> The second best selling book. Um, there's been seven editions 1940, 57, 70, 78, 85, 93, 2005, and now this gap to 2023. But I'll explain now why this long gap. And only seven authors have contributed to it Roberts himself, then McLaughlin and Liversitch did a few, McLean had two issues, and then the last issue was um, Phil Lockie, Peter Ryan, and Richard Dean. So here we are now with a new team. Uh, there's been a, a couple of changes of late. Um, so it's actually brand spanking new. In fact, one of them was only confirmed earlier this week, actually. So there's me on the left, Ben Smith for, of uh, Rhodes University, Peter Ryan, who many of us will know from uh, UCT, the Fitzpatrick Institute of African Ornithology. And Vincent Parker is also in the the audience tonight. He will be 
It's appointed as an assistant editor to, to help us, but he's also fulfills a very important role to make sense of Atlas data and the distribution of animals. That's his expertise. Um, many of you will know Vincent. He's published extensively and he's uh, that the, the two books of the, the atlases of Mozambique, uh, Southern and Central Mozambique. So he made a major contribution to um, so Southern African, even African ornithology to, to you know, plot what is a, still a, a relatively poorly known area. And for this, he was awarded about two weeks ago, maybe three, the BirdLife South Africa Eagle Owl Award. So just on behalf of everyone here, I just want to say massive congratulations, Vincent. Uh, well deserved. Right. Um, so that's the four of us. Okay, so let me take you. Look at all of these books. These are world standards. So you have um, the Birds of the Western Palearctic, all of those volumes. The Birds of no um, ANZAP, the Handbook of Australia, New Zealand, and Antarctic Birds. The Birds of the World, the uh, North American Birds, the Birds of Africa, Robert Seven. All of these books, and they weigh several kilograms and take up a tremendous amount of space in, in your, your personal library or on your desk. Um, how would you like to have that summarized? Just all in one at Birds of the World, you, you click on the species you want and you have access to all of that information or most of it. Right. So what we're doing at, at, in the Roberts 8 project is we are updating the, the Birds of the World account <clears throat> on, uh, and when you will have access to, you know, the most up-to-date and authoritative information about a species um, in Southern Africa, but as I'll explain just now, it extends beyond the traditional Southern African boundaries. But Laura will tell you more about uh, the birds of the world, but it is a tremendous resource. Uh, I'm very proud to be involved in the project and to be collaborating with them. Uh, yeah, it's a real joy. So just briefly, uh, probably a lot of it will become clear when I start answering questions and so on, and, and maybe from Laura stuff, but just briefly, Roberts 8 will, if you think Roberts 7 had detail, Roberts 8 takes it to an, another level because there are additional, let's call it sections or chapters that weren't covered in Roberts 7. And also Roberts 7 was a printed version um, so you were limited by space and so on. So, yeah, being a digital product, we have a, a, a leeway to just go you know, and include as much as possible information as, as, as we can. So there's a lot more detail about the distribution of animals, their behavior, longevity estimates, etc. One of the criticisms against Robert Seven was a lot of unpublished information, you know, information that couldn't be traced. And we want to try and stay clear of it as much as possible and use published information as you know where we can. Now, look, sometimes um, personal communication or unpublished data is inevitable, but we want to try and limit that to the absolute minimum, try and keep it at least if somebody wants to look up the information, they will be able to to find it. Um, we also have an expanded geographical coverage um, for the, the traditional Roberts, which was Southern Africa, uh, Eswatini, Mozambique, south of the Zambezi, um, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Namibia, Lesotho, and South Africa. We now extend it because Prince Edward Islands, it's part of South Africa, uh, and we have a couple of species that are endemic to the island, but that is also added. But we also add information about the species, if species occur beyond the Southern African borders, about their global range. Right. So often in, in Robert Seven, when you got to a, a species that doesn't breed yet and you wanted to read about its breeding or you know, when it breeds and where it breeds and so on, or its habitat, you didn't get that information. You had to go and look it up. We just, the Robert Seven was just Southern African habitat preference. Every now and again, you'll get some information about 
diabetic preference perhaps in, a, in its uh, breeding range. But for the most part, it was beyond the scope of Robert 7. Yeah, in this instance, we include information from across, across the species global range. Other new things would be uh, aspects like parasites, diseases, known causes of mortality, like you know, road kills, barbed wires, uh, collisions, etc. Um, also, more detail on mold patterns and strategies where available. Um, a nice aspect is a positive and negative uh, impacts of uh, or interactions with humans. Often, we just see the, the negative side, but there's also a positive side, and you know we, we can use that to, to mitigate in some instances. So, you know, we include, that is included. Uh, as I mentioned before, the inclusion of breeding details of species beyond, but doesn't breed in Southern Africa, for example. Um, more detail on vocalizations. Uh, in Robert 7, we, 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 the sonograms were dropped, so we didn't have information about sonograms, which is quite useful. I find sonograms very useful to interpret the sound. Um, but more detail about the the, uh, the sounds of, uh, and vocalizations of birds. Um, and not only a description of it, but you can also, in, in some instances, there are recordings available. You just click on them and, and, and Laura will, will show how that works. So there's a, a lot more, a lot greater scope for including a lot more detail and, and media, for example, as well. So in terms of the accounts, our focus still is mainly Southern Africa. Okay, but, but please don't misunderstand me. We will include, you know, beyond Africa. I'm, for example, just completed the African Finfoot account and it occurs from Southern Africa right up through to Senegal and, and the Gambia. So that is included. So our focus initially is to, to cover the endemics, the near endemics, inter-African breeding migrants. You know, so we have a tiered approach where we, we focus on what's sort of most common in, uh, and more important from a Southern African perspective. And then we'll start casting the net wider for species, for example, that have a, most of a distribution in the rest of Africa, only a small part perhaps in Southern Africa. And then also the Palearctic ones. People in the, the Palearctic regions, for example, species living there, there are people that are probably better placed to, you know, to provide first-hand information about species than we are. So although we'll, we'll try and cover as much as we can about Palearctic birds from our point of view, uh, we will mainly focus on its distribution in, in Southern Africa, its habitat preference, arrival, departure times, vocalizations, diet perhaps, and things like that. Not to say that we will not cover breeding, but it's likely that um, there are, as I mentioned, people better in, in better positions elsewhere in the world where the species and, and its breeding range that would be able to contribute that kind of information. So as I mentioned earlier, the, there's no restrictions on the length of the, the um, accounts, and we can add as much detail as possible. So you can say frogs, but you can also say which species of frogs, if, if, it's, if it's known in the diet, for example. Also the inclusion of media, sounds, uh, where in some places, in instances, video, um, photos, and I'll explain to you later where, where your photos can contribute. And the nice thing of it, uh, Robert's Aid being uh, a digital project, product for now, is that we have a continuous rollout. So in the past, with Robert 7, for example, it's, it, the work started in about, I think, 97 or 8, actually. And nobody really knew about it until it got close to the publication time, and then it was published in, in 2005, all at once. Yeah, we have the advantage that we can, as we finish an account, it can be published, it can be updated during the course of a project, and... Um, you know, people can contribute. You know, there's, there's constant call-outs. Okay, we need information about this species diet, for example. Uh, does anybody know anything about it? And it can be updated. Um, having said all of this, 
we've decided on a digital product for various region, re reasons, mainly a cost saving strategy. Uh, Robert Seven already was a huge book. It would be costly to repeat that. And given the amount of information that we're going to include, you look at at, at least a two volume book, the same as Robert Seven, at least two volumes. Right, so you, you can see it, it, it will be a costly exercise. Um, there's also you no, know, um, just a lot of people live in smaller places. You know, as all these books take up a lot of space. You have it on your laptop, all the information is there. You have uh, the, um, you know, the benefit of, of including media, etc. So that is the, why we moved over to a digital product. But I have to say at this very early stage, a printed version is not of the cards at all. Um, we decided we will finish a project um, and our, our uh, uh, contract or, or uh, collaboration with BOW clearly states that we can use whatever information we generate can be used by um, the John Bulker Bird Book Fund to, for any of the publications in their state. Right, but uh, we can chat a bit more about that. So how can you contribute? Keep atlasing. Um, you know, we improve the distribution, arrival, departure times, temporal distribution and so on. And that's where Vincent Parker's experience with um, Atlas data, and et cetera, will come in very, very handy. Um, we also have, um, if you have any observations, so often people tell me, you know what I saw? And I think, if only I, this person would publish it. Then we have a reference to it, and we can include it in the in the um, in the account. So if you have any observations, any photos that show something unique, perhaps courtship behavior, a nest, uh, diet, anything in the diet, perhaps a flight shot where the bird is molting, those are all of, of very good value. I scroll Instagram and all these online platforms regularly to to find information about the biology of birds. Uh, and you would be surprised how, how much information you can get. So I encourage everyone here to, if you have any interesting observations or photos, uh, I think now of Jonathan uh, in Mozambique uh, had a photo of a African pygmy kingfisher in July uh, in um, Gorongosa. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting record, being a midwinter record in Mozambique. Okay, so there's various avenues. You, you can publish your work in scientific journals, but that's not for everybody's, it's not everybody's cup of tea. And you have to be pretty thick skinned to, to submit something to a scientific journal, but a club newsletter is fine. Uh, it doesn't have to be peer reviewed. We don't really, you know, it's, it's not a requirement. In fact, an, a simple observation of a African fin food and a you know, eating a, a fish or something is, is worthy of, of publication or of noting, and it's never going to find a home in a journal as such. So your club newsletter would be fine um, or any other avenue that you that you can think of. Your, I think of a regional guides like Lanio Thurdus, Babbler, The Babbler, um, Honey Guide. Now, there's lots of nice local uh, Hornbill in um, Lowfeld. Lots of nice newsletters where you can publish your information and then you obviously you get referenced and your name will appear in the reference list of that species account. So that would be your legacy. Right, you can also upload your photos and sound, sound recordings to the Macaulay Library. Oh, there's other platforms as well, but yeah, we use the Macaulay Library mainly for, for the Roberts update. And I'm not sure if Laura's going to explain that, but if you drop me a note afterwards, I can send, send you instructions how to upload photos and other media to the Macaulay Library. Then a lot of people, including me, I'm also guilty, have a lot of data collected over the years. I'm thinking of a bird ringers, for example. Do a simple analysis and, and summarize that and, and have it published somewhere so that we can have a look at it. Um, you know, it might just be of, of use. Sometimes, uh, for example, Ursula Bryson in Namibia, she's got great data from a poorly known area 
about the biometrics of birds. And she's actually now um, submitted a lot of her stuff to me for publication in a, our local newsletter uh, magazine. So especially the ringers and people who have data that's not analyzed yet, analyze it, publish it. Uh, obviously, if it's you know, worthy of you know, like a scientific journal, then do it that way. But if it's something minor, uh, you know, then um, yeah, please consider analyzing it and publishing it in your in a local outlet or something like that. And then finally, we're, we're a big group here. Please spread the word to others. Uh, not everybody is still aware of Robert. So please spread the word and tell them about, you know, your photos mean something. Uh, if you hear of something, somebody that saw something very interesting, please encourage them to either contact me and we can talk about getting it published or to publish it in the local newsletter. But also, please let me know. I'm, I subscribe to many um, bird clubs, newsletters. Uh, some of the bird clubs kindly uh, allow me access to their newsletters because normally it's for members only or for some clubs at least. And they've kindly allowed me to access that for the use of Roberts. So please, uh, if, if you want to make sure that your bird club newsletter is on our mailing list, please let me know and um, I can confirm for you. Right, uh, so here's just a couple of examples of, of photos. Um, you know, you might think of this lark eating a, um, a gecko, but it's the first record of a lark eating a vertebrate. Right, so somebody will just you know, take a photo like that, but it was a very interesting record. The clutch of three red-eyed dove chicks, usually it's two. This was a, an eruption of <clears throat> edible or African bullfrogs. Um, and lots of birds arrived to, to eat them. So it's an extension of a diet for some species. Uh, an unusual food item for a oxpecker, a grasshopper. Normally it's ticks. Then ringers, you will have some sometimes something close in hand, like, you know, this scaly foot disease. Uh, you know, as a, as a ringer, you see something close, maybe eye colors or something like that, yeah, um, yeah report it so that we, you know, get that information to, to get the most comprehensive and authoritative accounts as possible. Okay, that's all for me. Um, I will hand over to Laura now, and then, yeah, afterwards we can answer your, your questions if you are still in. Thanks, Laura. All right. Great job. Thank you so much. I love that you focused on the fact that it's a collaborative and participatory platform. Um, Birds of the World isn't there only just to push out information. We accept information from the community of, of people that are out there, not only from you know, scientific experts, but people in the field who are seeing these things, whether it's the banders or bird guides that are taking photos or people who are collecting sound recordings. There's so still so much be, to be known about the birds of Africa. And we really want to make sure that our platform over time starts to reflect the very best knowledge that's available today. So it kind of takes participation from people at all levels. And we're very excited about working with Robert's Aids and, and, and getting this material on the platform. Um, so as, as Derek said, it's making all of this updated Robert's Aid material uh, available, not only um, for one click to a large number of people, it's, it's all over so Southern Africa. All of that information is now free and available to the public. So in, in many regions around the world, Birds of the World started out as a, um, a subscription resource. And that we kind of took the model, the business model of what Birds of North America used to be, which is something that the Cornell Lab had developed. And, and we applied that. And we realized that because we need this resource to be effective all over the world, globally, for use by scientists, researchers, conservationists, um, this particular business model doesn't work everywhere. So we are working with partners who are experts in their region to collaborate in their region to bring more information into birds of the world. And as a result of that, everybody in that region gets the information for free. Um, so we have uh, we have a handful of partners, um, maybe actually 15 different partners in, in regions that have opened up the resource to um, 
to people living and residing and accessing from that region. So, so this free access is a great benefit to everybody in the audience. And, and I'll show you how to log in and I'll also show you what you can expect once you get there. So I'll just go ahead and I'll, I'll start my, I'll turn off my video and I'll share my screen so that I can go over that. All right. So this is a typical Birds of the World species account, a lovely Cape Rock Jumper. It's one of the ones that has been updated in the last couple of years. I also want to show you several by Derek and his crew. Um, you know, you might, the, the, the URL for Birds of the World is, of course, birdsoftheworld.org. And you might get there by going to the homepage, or you could potentially get there by going to directly to a species account that you look up. You can put in the species name BOW after it, and there's a good chance you'll you'll get that as the first click. Um, but once you're once you arrive there, you're going to see. Let me show you this. It's going to look like this. You're going to have to click sign in at the top, um, and there's a blue button. You don't have to subscribe. Nobody here has to subscribe. You don't have to click that button. All you have to do is click sign in. And then here you would create a Cornell Lab account. And once you create that account, you know, see I've already have my account. So I just click sign in. So in the future, you'll either be signed in or you'll have to re-sign in again for every return visit. But that that ensures you get access and and um, because access is you know kind of somewhat controlled around the world. We've got different policies. Um, so I wanted to show you um, a little bit about you know, what you can find on the homepage. The overview is this. There's a couple different ways that you can uh, enter, you know, use the search bar to find a species or family name. Yeah, one thing we didn't mention yet is that Birds of the World has 10,906 bird species. In about a week and a half, there's going to be uh, a lot more because we do annual taxonomy updates. So the entire system that's driving this database is, is based on a flexible taxonomic system. And so when eBird and Clements releases their new version of the taxonomy, it is updated in, in both eBird and Macaulay Library and Birds of the World and, and Merlin Bird ID very flexibly. So um, it's a process that takes about I think two solid weeks. So over the next couple of weeks, there's going to be a little bit of, little bit of jigginess in the background. Um, but but yes, yeah, so we are based on the eBird Clemens taxonomy, which is one of the three major taxonomies, and they're all coming together. So I think only a couple more years with that, we'll all be using the same ta taxonomy. But there's there's um, something I'll show you later in a preference that we could re we can return to that um, that concept. So yes, right now we have 10,900 species and we also have family accounts. So I wanna show you um, a family account by going to the rock jumper again. Okay, well, let's go to rock, rock tarm again anyway. Just take that. So up here you have the expandable te uh, taxonomy explorer, which you can have all the birds in the world when it opens, but you can also use it to filter by your region. So you can go either by Southern Africa, Africa, or you can actually put in South Africa or whatever country you are interested in at the time. And that will just return the birds of South Africa primarily. You'll see a few extra, and that's a little complicated reason why I won't tell you, I won't get into that, but. This is one way that you can get in and find the birds. One thing that I do on my on my um, on my keyboard is keyboard is I go uh, Control F. Well, I kind of do a find. So if I want to say rock, you know, uh, rock jumper, it can take me straight down. So there I am back at the rock jumper again. Okay, so just back to the home page again. Um, we have. 2,000, more than 2,000 authors that are working with us now. And like I said, about 15 different partners that are also in the process of developing and training new authors in their region. Um, we release somewhere between four to six different uh, newly updated species accounts every, every week. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a slow, but, but 
really regular process. We've got a team of editors here working to uh, kind of finalize the content once it comes in from our partners. And whenever you are logged in, you could click here to see the recently updated uh, species accounts, okay? And so there's a thing called full revision, which means an author has, or an author group has taken responsibility for really bringing everything that's known about that species um, that they were able to surface uh, to the species account. We sometimes have lots of minor revisions too. That might mean one of our plumage experts has just written more about the plumage, or it might mean the taxonomy update. We went in and we um, revised some of the taxonomy when there has been a major update. So you'll actually see a lot of smaller revisions being reflected in our recent update, but this is basically a, um, a chronological view of that. So I don't think there's anything more on the front page I wanna show you. So let's go into, oh, there is one thing. I wanna just point out this about section because there is some good information here. There's there's what I call it the front or the about section. And there's information on our history about the partners and the source content that um, that I that becomes important. You, there's questions that you might have as you go through it about how the range maps were made, why there are different types. Um, and there is a full species list, eBird Clemens species list here and also a direct access to, to James Jobling's um, key to scientific name. So if anyone's familiar with what that is, um, that would be a direct access to that, but there's another way to do it too, which I'll show you in a minute. So just wanna point that out. There's some good stuff there. Um, there's two types, I'm gonna show, the, show you too, the source content, right? We started with the really long form accounts from Birds of North America, which is something the Cornell Lab um, had created with, in, in collaboration with the American Ornitholo Ornithological Society. Um, of course, Handbook of Birds of the World Alive, which I believe was 17 volumes set in print and went digital um, some, somewhere in the 2000s. Um, Birds of North America was also in print and then it went, uh, went digital in 2005. We also brought in Neotropical Birds, which were digital. And we're now we're adding birds of um, Southern Africa, which is great. And there's also, um, um, let's see, bird families of the world as well. So I think I was, that reminds me, I was gonna show you the family account of that bird. So let me go find it. I think the cape is here. It, so we have the, the, yeah, the taxonomy. And if you click on family, this will give you the family. Wouldn't I choose a monotypic? Well, there's two species here. Okay, so we've got two species in the, uh, I don't know how to say that. Let me try it. Catopidae. <laughs> um, so I want you to just be aware that if you click on the family, uh, this this blue link on the family, you will find everything in the um, in that family and also everything in that genus. So that's something to think about. Um, let's see, I want to show you now one of the accounts, I want to go over in detail, the South African shell duck, which was produced by David Allen, who's part of the Roberts 8 crew, or re was still recently. Um, great ornithologist. When you open up any account, you have kind of what we call um, sort of like this is the roll deck of, of species that are close in that um that are taxonomically closed, either you know front or back. But here you, you've got the name of the birds, the common name, the scientific name, the IUCN status of that bird globally. Now, one thing that happens is that um, sometimes it might be endangered or, or threatened near you, but globally it isn't. So just keep in, keep in mind that that's a global status. We also provide several different, the species name in several different um, common names. And in fact, if you prefer to have your, you know, um, you uh, English South African, then there is a way to make that change. And I'll show you in a bit. And if I forget, please ask me, please, um, please ask me later. 
So when you click on this, you get a carousel of these species. And this is what we call the hero deck. And this shows the species that are, or photos of the species that are most representative of that, of that bird. Typically they're chosen by one of our experts or in, with, in consultation with the authors um, about which birds represent it geographically or age-wise. We also um, pick one single video. I think I script it. And we also pick a representative sound. So that's a fun sound. So these this um, these images, all this multimedia, are stored in the Macaulay Library, and I'll discuss that integration in a little bit. But of course, you want to see the pretty pictures and you want to read an overview. You know, most of us um, want to just get right into the introduction to this species. And this is a really, uh, the introduction provides a nice, um, nice context for the bird, generally where it lives, generally it's maybe its conservation status, what it looks like, and perhaps something really interesting about it. If you come over here, we, ha we have, what we're doing now is we're taking the base bird life maps and then our maps team are, are looking at sort of like comparing that to eBird sightings that are um, more recent. And if there's uh, if the range has moved or shifted or if there's any extreme sightings that are verifiable, then that data is brought into the map as well. So that's why in this particular case, it says BirdLife International and Cornell Lab. So this is a combination of BirdLife and Cornell's, you know, very best scientific guess on where, you know, where the range of the species is. We also have scientific illustrations of every species. And then, and then we get into the real, real deep content, field identification and similar species. I won't click everywhere. There's just, or you'll get dizzy, but um, we go deep into plumages and molts and bare parts and measurements. Um, we give an overview of the, the systematics history of the species um, and where subspecies are relevant. We also have a lot of information on that. So I'll, I'll give you an example of the barn owl in a little bit. But um, we talk about related species, subspecies, hybridization, and, and nomenclature. And this is actually really helpful as a birder. I didn't you know, which I've, I've sort of discovered in the last few years. Sometimes when you need to understand how the scientists um, define uh, a sound and how they describe a sound, that helps you then understand and communicate about that sound that species is making. And so reading about the vocalizations um, in detail here and understanding what they all mean really helps you just become a better birder in the field. So for example, this bird, it has a vo it describes the whole vocal array, disyllabic honk, monosyllabic honk, duet, core, hiss, other. And so for a lot of species, we go into the detail on all, all that. Of course, the behavior section has, you know, just a lot of stuff. And oftentimes we're wondering what a bird is doing in the field. So we come here and we figure out, you know, what does its territorial behavior, what does its courtship behavior look like? Um, what is its, um, and, you know, territorial predatory behavior. This is a place where you can come and, and read about it from people who are really smart and have studied this in the field and, 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 and written about it. So it's a um, ter terribly useful section, um, which I just love. And since I have breeding, uh, the breeding session section also very good. Uh, I do a lot of, um, breeding bird surveys and I also have nest boxes. And so I'm look, I'm really always asking myself about the phenology, the seasonal, the seasonal arrivals and departures and breeding dates and departure dates. Um, that kind of stuff becomes really vital to what I'm doing as a birder in trying to understand everything possibly possible about birds. Wanted to point out here that we have a very extensive uh, reference section. So everything that we put in Birds of the World, uh, almost everything has a, uh, you know, has a, a reference attached to it. So 
you can see all of that so you can take your study a step further. <clears throat> we also have what we call inline um, photographs. And if I find one, I shall show you. Um, and information on demography and populations, conservation and management, priorities for free future research. So if you're a scientist that might be, or a student, you know, just learning, well, what isn't known? What is a gap I could feel, I could fill with my research? That is a good thing to, to give a look at. And of course we have information about the author. So this tells us about David Allen. And I don't want you to miss this multimedia section. So we showed you at the top, there was, you know, the hero section, but there is an extensive multimedia section. Every, uh, every account is deeply integrated with both eBird, which is a bird observation program, you know, a, um, which is a bird checklist program that allows you to collect uh, bird information in the field. And then what we do is that we, we gather it, we curate it, and we disseminate it either in specific maps or allow people to manage their checklists just for fun. Um, and that allows us to get the maps in here. Um, but it also, through the eBird app, you can use that to, to submit, well, actually not the app, but the desktop version of eBird allows you to submit photos, uh, photos and sound recordings of the species that you see. And there's two advantages to that. One is that you, um, it's an archive for you. We make tools that we hope also work for you because it's got a very good kind of searchability. Um, it arranges it according to time, you know, place, place, place and date. So that helps you reconstruct your trips and it helps you reconstruct your numbers, your life list, things like that. Um, so we try to make it fun for you while also making it valuable for science. So the multimedia that is put into the Macaulay Library Wildlife Media Archive by users, just like many of you out there, could potentially be important enough, as Derek said, to, to showcase a certain behavior or diet or foraging, um, you know, something about the bird, something that tells us about its life history. And then that could potentially wind up on our on the multimedia section of an account, so um, so that's one of the reasons we're we're you know kind of doing this outreach to others. It's like the the tools are here um, not for us to grab, but for us to share. Right the 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 the, the data and the multimedia that you provide goes back into science, it goes back into conservation, it goes back into allowing so many people to better understand the birds through pictures and the sounds and, and range data. So we do appreciate anybody who's already involved in that and would love to have more. We could, we could teach you and, and give you the right resources you need to get deeper into it. Um, let's see. I wanted to show you on the barn owl the example of um, um, the subspecies. As you know, there's many subspecies. So if I go to systematics and subspecies, there are many, many, many different types. And so for that, this is the ALBA group subspecies. Not only do we bring in individual scientific illustrations, but we also allow you to click on a map, the, the actual eBird sightings to find out where that ALBA subspecies was sighted. And that goes the same, we've got the African further down. Same thing with photos. And, um, and others, and the, we've got the same setup for the hybrids as well. So I know I want to wrap up really soon. Let me show you a few things. Of course, common name spellings are really important across the world. The, the species accounts are written in American English, but what we've allowed for is the ability to change your preferences for, uh, for what language you work in, because it's just essential. This is a global project. So if you sign in and go to preferences, it's going to take you, I believe, to this page. 
No, let me see. Hold on. Preferences. And right at the top, you should see common name translated to. And we have more than 95 different languages and language variations. And we have, I don't know, 10 or 12 for, for English. So you might be interested in South Africa or IOC or the old HBW, whatever works for you, that's going to provide this, the common name, the common name only in, um, in a language, that, that your language, and therefore allow you to search better. Because what happens with gray and gray, it's quite difficult <laughs> to, uh, you know, to get the gray right. And that can be very frustrating. So um, I do encourage you to use that if that's if that makes it more comfortable for you. Um, so I just want to say thanks again to Roberts 8 um, for joining us on this project. Um, it's it's critical. It's important. And one of the I want to just show you a quick view They've already been able to publish the Olive Headed Warb Weaver account. Short Clawed Lark account. Thank you, Derek. And let's see, what's that other one? Short, what am I missing, Derek? Um, scaly Feathered Finch. Which one? Scaly Feathered Finch. Okay, well, you'll have to show that in your screen. Uh, but <laughs> how to get that spelling wrong? Um, but yeah, so I think I'll open up to questions now. I think I covered everything I wanted to, but um, yeah, if there's anything else, let me know. I'll keep this up here. Thanks so much, Laura and Derek. Uh, really a very interesting presentation and, and some exciting stuff uh, happening. So I've asked uh, uh, people to type their questions in the chat. So I don't know if you want me to read the questions or if you want to go there and pick them up yourself. Um, I'm happy to do the reading. So let's start with the first one, action on invasives like minus, if, if there is any. I think that's advice for yeah. for dealing with invasives okay so so the roberts will kind of just address it and say these are the issues with minus um yeah it's, it's a different matter how you're going to control it or something so what what roberts will do is it's be it will be the authoritative text on minus in in africa or southern africa specifically um there are sections dealing with human interactions uh, and so on. And possibly, remember, we, we try and stick to, to published literature. So if there's information available about minor control or something like that, or the history of minor control, it's likely to be included in that text. So as Laura said, Robert's eight is there for, we, we have to cover from layman, which includes perhaps even primary school children looking for uh, information about a bird project or something, right through to your serious scientist, ornithologist or something. So the, the information must be understandable to laymen, but also be suitable for a scientist or an ornithologist or you know, environmental manager to, to be able to use it in reports or something like that. Um, so I think if I answer your question, you will have to look in that relevant section on, on minor problems and how to control it. Um, but yeah, I'm not there to give uh, for, at this, on this platform advice on how to control them. Um, I don't know, does that sound all right? Does it answer the question? So you, you'll find the information in the, in the text. Um, what has been done, obviously, there's continuous research on it all over the world on the minor problem, even in Australia and so on. And yeah, uh, you will have to weigh up the options. Yeah, I think right, I think so he... there's a, sorry, Laura, go ahead. I just said, I think he covered that, definitely. So there's a question from Faraz who had to leave, uh, but he says, as a photographer, I have some images of birds that aren't often photographed which I'd like to contribute to Birds of the World, but I don't always have the data to submit 
a backdated eBirds list. Any suggestions would be welcome. He says he had to leave, but he's asking me <laughs> to report back to him if there's anything. Oh, that's such a great question. So important. Um, so the, eBird has allowed the ability to upload a checklist that doesn't necessarily have a date attached to it. So it's, it's important to know that eBird is based on date and time because it was it was built both as um, a checklist and enjoyment program, but for scientific uh, use. So for it to be valuable to create all of these range maps, the date and date and place are, are critical. But we did a lot, knowing that so many people just really do, don't have that information, they allowed some sort of uh, upload possibility through a, through a checklist um, that you create. And I believe, although I'm not sure, I believe that once you upload a quote unquote checklist without specific dates, then you can attach media to it. And now that it's important to know that that the actual bird data might not go into range maps because we don't know when that was, right? We can't allow that to, to shift the range, but it's, I, I, I would be willing to bet that the, the, the images are still in the Cully Library. And if not, I mean, I love the fact that you have photographs of birds that don't have a lot available. Please work with us. <laughs> um, you know, directly reach out to me and I'll connect you to the editors who are always on the lookout for, you know, interactions that we haven't seen before, birds that aren't well photographed. Um, you can go to Macaulay Library yourself. Um, this is the Macaulay Library, and I had searched for Cape Rock Jumper already. And I, I searched there and I put best quality. You've got most recent, recently uploaded, and then you've got best quality, and that's where you'll you'll see them. Um, but look, put your species in, see how many different uh, photos there are, or how many different sound recordings there are. And for some of the African species, there isn't a lot, and we really need it. And let me tell you something too. If I, I'm sorry if I'm getting off track, but if anyone um, in the audience has not yet tried the Merlin Bird ID app, give it a try. We have uh, a bird pack for species. Uh, it's a bird identification app. And it allows you to, to identify birds by sight, sound, or, or um, um, by answering three simple questions. And there's a sound model that we have developed, the people at Macaulay Library are developing for every species. So right now, I, I don't know how many, a good percentage of the species already can be modeled so that we can you can hold your app up in the air and just by hearing it, it can tell you what bird is singing. But we can only do that. We're using machine learning on these sounds in order to define that. We're, we can only do that if we have enough sounds for every species, right? So we're working, we've got about, I don't know, 13% of the species already modeled for South Africa. And we've got more to work on because, you know, it's not it's not an overnight process. Our, our machines and our models are working on it. Um, but the value of you putting in sound recordings means that we can also help develop that tool so that it could then just go back out in this free app available to everybody. So sorry for that rant, but it's it's so important. Like what we're doing is allowing all these other things to expand and then get in the hands of people who need it. Can I just... I, let, uh, sorry, go ahead, Derek. Okay, I just want to add that um, I often use my historic data photos and you know you don't have to have a, a one meter resolution wherever you found it so if I just like Paul Aquane, it would be fine for for eBird and quite often if you don't have a date you can just go on the camera in the photo in Photoshop or you know some of these places you can say date create see date date created and things like that so you can have a date and uh and the time, uh, a date and a locality, actually, uh, which is quite useful for for um, eBird. And when you just create the historic list, um, and sometimes I just have, you know, it's a nest that I observed, and it's just for one species, it's fine. Um, as long as there's a date and a locality for historic lists. Like Laura said, I haven't tried the, the non-locality or date one, but uh, creating a historic list is easy, and I... If um, the person who posted that, I can't send information, but Laura can also 
and just get in contact right. with a, a person who wants it. Right. Now um, this will, this uh, this recording will be on our YouTube channel as well, so for us can review it there okay. when it's available. So there is a. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a question. Uh, uh, Lynette says, I've got videos of a black-bellied starling, of black-bellied starlings rubbing what looked like a piece of mouse fur around the entrance hole of their nest. Videos on YouTube, spoke to you, Chittenden about it, and he's only seen this behavior twice before. I, I think the question then is, is that something useful? So, yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Yeah, well, um, maybe you could answer this one better, better, Derek. Having perhaps used you know Canto, if in in yeah. some of your research here, so I'm going to let you handle that. Okay, no, so that is definitely useful. Um, yeah, in a case like that, if it's on YouTube, we we can put a link in the text, but it's obviously up to the author if it if it needs to you know to strengthen an account. You can have it from YouTube. I know the Macaulay Library allows some video up uploads, but it's quite restricted. You can, for obvious reasons, because if everybody starts submitting videos, it can get tricky. So it is a, a process, but we can put a link into a YouTube video. Um, obviously, it would be nice if you have your local bird club newsletter and just explain a bit the, the context and then put the the link in, in 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 the bird club newsletter and we can use then that as we can use that as a reference um let's say i don't know who posted it but let's say um derek 1990 uh, 2023 saw this uh and see the link but just to place context because if you just see the video and it's not not other text associated with it usually for these things you need a locality and a date and so on which is quite useful in a in a local bird club magazine or a something like that. So the short answer is yes, we, we can have a, a link to a YouTube video. The same for, and I think it's the next, next question, for, uh, I know a lot of people use Zeno Canto, Canto. I also have a lot of recordings on Zeno Canto. Um, we, and you, I think it's for Olive Edit Weaver account, there is actually a link to, to Zeno Canto vocalization. Um, I've used it in, I think, in the short code Lark account too, if I recall. So it is possible, but you can also, by the same token, you can also upload to, to Macaulay Library. I think, I, Laura, you just added on some vocalizations from, from the Macaulay Library of, yeah, there we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's all the calls with sonograms on, so yeah, it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. Obviously, we would <laughs> like to promote Macaulay, but, uh, well, because it's so closely associated with, with um the birds of the world, but it's not, you know, it's not cast stone. If you want to use Zeno Canto, it's not. Yeah. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'm going to sneak, I'm going to sneak a question in here if I can. <laughs> um, I, I see that all of the material on the site seems to be very firmly copyrighted. Is there, is there any reason for that? Is there any reason not to use more permissive licenses so that people can reuse the content? Um, well, do you mean the the textual content, or are you talking more about the media? Uh, well, I was specifically talking about the media, but I suppose the question could apply to text as well. Yeah. Okay. So the media, because we, you know, we're because these are user contributed, they retain the copyright. So we don't have the authority to give anyone else the copyright to other people's content, right? So people um, who work with us are very generous in donating it to the Macaulay Library where it can be used for research and conservation. So um, so we, we, we don't have the authority to allow others to use it. We use it extensively in our, in our, in our research conservation and, and our web tools, our web tools and our apps. Um, but we, yeah, it's definitely something that you would have to go to the original um, copyright holder for. Well, all, all it would require is a little box that said check uh, attribution, license, attribution, share, like at whatever. Yeah, so uh, there full is, copyright. Yeah, so let's see there. I believe there is actually a embed code that allows the copyright to stay with it that, that can be used for educational purposes. Um, but yeah, that, but that's boring. <laughs> a little bit less. Uh, yeah. 
there's, I think that there, there's probably a little bit that I'm not saying quite correctly. So I'm going to just say, contact us if you'd like to use anything. No, but I mean, there's, uh, so look, uh, I don't want to get into this now and, and, and take, take the, uh, the focus away. It's just that, you know, I, I prefer to give my stuff out under a Creative Commons license, so I wouldn't be able to put it up here because I wouldn't want it to be copyrighted. Mm, that's a good question. That's a good you see, point. you see what I'm saying. I, 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 I want, I, I want a society that shares, and yes. in that society that shares, people should be able to share if they want to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's that's, that's my point. point. Yeah, I'll get back to you on that because I don't know that it. Um... There's some restrictions on some of the content, and I don't know which ones. So I'll get back to you. Okay. Uh, then there's a question: Will Roberts Eight be available as an app, like Roberts Bird Guide? Uh, it would be definitely great. Um, no, uh, not on our part. <laughs> Derek. Um, um, yeah. So no, look, um, Birds of a World is not is not an app. So it's an it's you know. It's, desktop application. We have a Roberts field guide app, but version two, I think since version version two, it actually has the content from Roberts seven included. Um, <clears throat> if you go onto a species account, you'll see, you know, the, the brief field guide explanation and then it will say the Roberts seven text. So as I mentioned before, it's not all for cards to have a printed version. But we did a kind of a, a brief survey, well, probably about 10 years ago now. And the majority of respondents said I would prefer a digital Roberts, actually. Um, which makes sense. I mean, your, your options are just so much more. So in terms of an app, the field guide is still the, that is the, the actual app with some sound and everything. And I foresee that in future the the updated Roberts 8 texts will be included in the app if it is not printed as a, um, um, a you know, a hard copy handbook, basically. So, yeah, so it will be, it's still the app, possibly with the Roberts 8 text included there. As I said, all that the information we generate as part of Roberts 8 can be used by um, Roberts uh, eight uh, um, by, by various field guides, nest and eggs, you know, all the typical books in the, the John Wilker Bird Book Fund's uh, stable. I don't know. Is that... Right. So, so there's uh, there were a couple of other questions that were the same as that one, so I will skip them. Uh, some of our SA bird list websites list IOC species names. Um, but how do we align IOC and BOW species names? The lesser sand plover has not been renamed to Tibetan sand plover that you can't find in BOW. How do you resolve the issues like this? Any yes. view on the road ahead? Right. So we've we've got two members from the World Taxonomic Authority, W WCAG, WGAC. <laughs> it's a complicated name. So the World Taxonomic Authorities are working with us on this project. So there's a committee um, from the, the from the major taxonomies, and the 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 understanding is that these are all coming together. And so every year, these people uh, are working really hard to review all the evidence to try to um, to to make sure these come together as closely as, as possible, so that eventually we emerge with just one taxonomy. Um, so so. They believe we're we're trying to push that towards um, you know the eBird Clements you know that's what the authorities are doing because we have the flexible background here that that responds to this content information so I don't know how soon that's going to be I can't say it's happening there's a lot of work on it but in the meantime just change your preferences to English IOC if that becomes too great of a stumbling block. Okay, there's another question about an app. Uh, can natural science specimen photographs be uploaded? Uh, let's see, do you mean things from museums? If, if that's what you mean, I know that they are, I think that we have some in the library. I think that's a better question for the editors. I don't know that we, we, 
wouldn't typically have them in and here like this, but I know sometimes they're really important for the plumage for describing the plumages. So you know, as far as I know, as far as I know, not. But I, I can imagine there would be instances where, like you say, it would be necessary. And then I think you probably speak to the uh, POW editors, the management, to maybe, if it is necessary, I'm sure they would consider it. But yeah, I don't think it's not yeah. the, the norm. So sometimes we've, you know, we've been approached by people who have skins for extinct species, for example, and and we're always interested in having that discussion so that the, the you know talking with the editors would be the best uh, best route there so that they can you know just assess what you have and where that particular species account is in its evolution you know we have a lot that are updated we have a lot that are not and we've got many in progress um, with authors already established and working on them. And then there's some that are still waiting for the updates. They're still the old short form HBWs and, and we're, they're still waiting to find an author to, to adopt it. Right, there's a question from Lydia. Hi, I used the Merlin app wonderfully in the USA in August, but I found that the Merlin doesn't have wide recognition of sounds for Southern African birds. Should we submit bird sounds from South Africa to Birds of the World app? for them to be sent through to the Merlin app, perhaps. Lydia, I'm so glad you asked. And yes, absolutely. Um, because it only takes about a hundred sounds of the full repertoire of a species to be able to model the South African bird. So, um, and that's, you know, that give or take, but about hundred different sounds are all we need in order to define the vocal repertoire of a species and get it modeled for Merlin bird sound ID. So yes, yes, please. Anthony asks, um, Laura, birds of the world, I personally find that the computer aided sound identification of birds in South Africa. I think this is a very similar question. I expect this may work better in more, more, more developed countries. Yeah, we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, Lynette says, would it be much easier if you took my, that's her 1,200 plus recordings off the Nocanto. There's no way I've got time to load all of those onto BOW. <clears throat> I, you know, I know that our editors have worked closely with the creators of Xenocanto. I don't know if there's any plans to do, to do that or to be able to do that. I think Xenocanto is a, is a, is an independent, well-loved resource. I don't know if it's going anywhere, so. Um, I don't know, but we, we can't, you know, we can't physically do that. So if anyone does have the time and the ability, that would be amazing. And if you it do- It would probably be a two line script written in, in Bash that could do that. Uh, just would need somebody to do it. Yeah. And permission. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think she's given permission. A lot of the Xenocanto stuff, but th th then you run into the uh, copyright issues again, because your copyright, a lot of Xenocanto isn't. Right. So, yeah, there are things to work out business-wise. Yeah. Um, can I contribute in a project by naming the birds in my home language? Yes. Yes, you can. Um, I didn't point out that we do have Afrikaans as a language, but see, we have volunteers all over the world that are giving us common names in their languages. And for some, we have 100% of the birds. And for some, we only have 10 to 50 or, you know, percent. So, so yes, welcome, Ollie. I really appreciate that. Um, and reach out to me. I'm going to, I'm going to type my, I'm going to type my email down here and I will get you to the right person. That would be Marshall Iliff. And he does, um, he works with the taxonomy. So he works with the common name data set for all 95 languages. So question regarding, say, sorry, Mokumole. go ahead. Uh, Mokumole, I'm not sure where you're from, but there is a, a, a names group. Uh, Ernest is in, a, uh, it's for South African, Southern African bird name group. I think it's their name. They are trying to collate all the, the names of birds in, in indigenous African languages. Um, for many African languages, as you know, they just have a group name. So for larks, it is just Sabota. All 30 are called Sabota. So the aim is to 
to move over to to get a species specific name for every individual um bird so there is a group you can either yeah make contact with me email me afterwards and i can also send you the detail for that group right here's another question is it possible to save the filters like the regions as a preset in order not to have to put this filter back again each time. Yeah, so sorry, that is not yet possible. Um, we just have this problem with so many great things to do and they're so important. We, we hope to be able to do that sometime within the next year. It's on the list, it's on the list. It's just the list keeps getting longer. But, uh, you know, so the question is, you know, when they go here, can you click so Southern Africa and have it stay Every single time you click back, can that be a preset? And um, just not yet, not yet. So I think that's the last question. Someone posted a, list, a link to upload historical media in eBird. Um, that will that that will go into the text. So I will fire that off to Faraz, who was asking that question anyway. Great, thank you for doing that. And that's it. I think we are we are done. And and uh, thanks everybody for for joining us and and for participating in in this evening's webinar. And as I mentioned, uh, next week Thursday, uh, we have another one on unraveling Darwin's mystery of mysteries: insights into the origin of species from birds of the Solomon Islands by Dr. Al I. And uh, that's also going to be an interesting one, I think. So hopefully, we'll see some of you there. All right. Thank you so and much. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, and thanks, thanks Laura and Derek. Thanks very much for, for making this presentation and for spending the time with us. All right, great. Have it's a, great a pleasure. Day. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.